everyone, it's Mr. Canfield. Today we are doing lesson one five called conditional statements. Sorry, um, I, uh, I have the notes set up in uh, some of my favorite software. I'm able to write on things, it's really good. Um, I got this from another teacher and they, just, they ripped the textbook and put it on. And especially for, for this section, it's really helpful. So if you're gonna take good notes on this, which I highly recommend, because there's a lot of vocabulary and um, ideas that we're gonna have to think about. You'd want to call it lesson one five or whatever and conditional statements and really the the word that we're going to use here is logic this is really going to, to use some formal logic language um, and logic might be a word that you're familiar with it's just the idea of reasoning um, and reasoning in a and we're going to reason formally we're going to use some formal language uh, formal is just like official language you know it's it's not necessarily super confusing, but we are going to use words like biconditional, conclusion, conditional, contrapositive, converse, hypothesis, inverse, negation, truth table, truth value. So we might use some of these words today. Um, I don't actually think we wind up doing a truth table. We might do a truth table. But anyway, we're going to be going through and using this language. So um, as we learn what these are, I might come back to this page. Uh, if, if you're in class, I, I'm actually giving you a handout of all these pages to save you some writing on, some, on the problems, and then you can actually write about the problems on there. So, you know, I, I might come back and write down what some of these are, or link some of these together, such as um, hypothesis and conclusion are going to go together, which we'll get to in a little bit. So, here we go. Um, this is kind of our starting activity or launch activity. So I'll, I'll zoom in a little bit for the screen and we're going to look at constructing arguments which is one of the math practices that uh, the, uh, the country decided we needed to have. <laughs> um, determine whether each effect is always true for the given cause. So cause, if it's raining, effect, then it's spring. Is this true or is this false? If x and y are whole numbers, then their difference, x minus y, is a whole number. Is that true? If water is heated, then it boils. Is that always true? If a triangle has a right angle, then it is a right angle, or a right triangle, sorry. Is that always true? And then, if your favorite color is blue, then you are a good speller. Is that always true? So, We'll talk through those super obvious ones first, then we'll look at the not so obvious ones. If it is raining, then it is spring. Um, I am currently filming this in the fall and it rained the other day. Uh, so no, that is, that is not true. So I'm gonna write a big F there for failure. No, no, for false, right? So this is not always true. This is sometimes false. Um, and when we are using formal reasoning and formal logic, we shouldn't say a sentence like this. Um, because it's not always true. If it's raining, could it be spring? Of course, but it can also rain in the fall and the summer and the winter. Um, the second one we'll have to come back to. Let's see, if water is heated, then it boils. I think we're gonna come back to that one too. If a triangle has a right angle, then it is a right triangle. This one is always true. The definition of a right triangle is that it's a triangle with a right angle in it. Um, so that's just by definition, that's true. And then if your favorite color is blue, then you are a good speller. Is this always true? And I'm going to say, no, it's not. And what does blue have to do with being a good speller? Nothing. They're completely unrelated. So sometimes this may be true, but it's not because your favorite color is blue. You're a good speller for different reasons. Okay, so let's go back to the two where, where I think there might be some confusion. If water is heated, then it boils. If water is heated by fire like this for long enough, then it probably will boil. That That's, but there's a lot of extra statements there. If water is heated, then it boils. Well, what about when water's not heated with a hot enough heat source and it doesn't boil? You're just warming it up in the microwave for a couple seconds. Like, So I'm gonna say that this is not always true. Or if I leave cold water out in the sun, it heats up, but that doesn't make it boil. Um, unless maybe you live in Arizona or something. 
I'm just kidding. Okay, so if x and y are whole numbers, then their difference, x minus y, is a whole number. So this is something where if it's always true, then great. So like if you have 30 and you have 5, well, 30 minus 5, you get 25. That's a whole number. Does that always work? Do you always get a whole number out? And you might be thinking, yes. And it really depends on what you mean when you think of a whole number. So I just want to remind you, technically speaking, whole numbers start at the whole and go up. So they start at 0, 1, 2, 3, et cetera, et cetera. So you might see where I'm going with this. Whole numbers are not allowed to be negative numbers. So if I use these same two whole numbers, but instead I talked about them as 5 and 30, 5 minus 30 is negative 25. Negative 25 does not fit into this classification of whole numbers. It fits into a new classification that we call integers. Most people I know don't ever use the word integers. They usually just use the word whole numbers to talk about either one. Um, so if that's kind of the way you were thinking about it, I would agree with you. If I want to get super technical, I would say this is not actually true. But again, I get what you're saying if you're saying it was true, if you were thinking negative numbers count as whole numbers. So if we're being super exact, all right, I think I've said that enough. Okay, let's keep moving. Um, wait. Oh. All right, so this next part in the lesson, I'm going to give everyone a chance to, to write down if-then statements on their own, and two statements that are always true, and two statements that are not necessarily true. So um, I'll, I'll write some here. Let's, let's, uh, let's do one. If an animal has four legs, then it is a cat. I like that one. So I've got that one. I'm going to write three more. If a dog is hot, then it drools, or not drools, uh, pants. If you press the brake, then your car will stop. Oh wait, I'm supposed to make, uh, I'm just, feel free to skip ahead a little bit, but um, I'm supposed to make two always true and two not necessarily always true. statements. I have four statements here. Um, and I don't know if I followed the rules or not. So they may either all be false, all be true. I was supposed to make two that were definitely true all the time and two that were sometimes true. But let's see what we got. If an animal has four legs, then it is a cat. Um, hopefully you know that that is not always true. There are some animals with four legs that are not cats. For example, elephants. Okay. It, so that's sometimes true, sometimes not true. If you press the brake, then your car will stop. You might want to say this is always true. What if your car's already stopped? Well, then it's not going to stop. Or what if the brake lines are cut? Well, then the brake doesn't do anything. Or what if your brakes are broken? It doesn't do anything. So this one is also false. If it is raining, then water is coming out of the sky. I'm going to say this is always true. I cannot think of another situation because raining just means that water is coming out of the sky. And then, if your name has at least two letters in it, then one of them is a consonant. Um, so, I think this is probably true, but I don't know every name ever, and maybe there's a name that's like, woo, and it's just two vowels. 
or like a name like A, and that's his name. So like the, the maybe your name only has two letters and there's no consonants in it. So I'm gonna say this is false, but I, you know, it's definitely a grayer area. <laughs> I'm curious to see what you came up with. Um, okay, so conditional statement is an if-then statement. What we've been looking at right now, these are conditional statements. Let's look at what the word conditional actually means broken down. It's got the word condition. Um, it's like there's a certain condition that has to be met. So let's, uh, let's just read this uh, together. A conditional is an if-then statement that relates a hypothesis. That's our if. The, oh, the part that follows if to a conclusion, the part that follows then. So they can also be represented as P arrow Q, reading, uh, we read that as if P then Q. That little arrow takes the if and the then and it puts them together. So P represents the hypothesis and Q is the conclusion. So if we look at this situation, write the statement as a conditional, you can register to vote if you are at least 18 years old. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna look for the if, the hypothesis, and the conclusion, the then. So our if, if you're at least 18 years old, we would call that the if or the hypo hypothesis. I almost said hypotenuse. And then you can register to vote. That would be our conclusion, right? So we would say, if you are at least 18 years old, then you may register to vote. So we're saying the same thing, we're just writing it in a special way called a conditional statement. Um, we're setting up by showing the condition first, the hypothesis first, and then we show the conclusion. So on this next page, if you paused it, you saw where I'm going with this. We're gonna write this as a conditional. A square must have four congruent sides. Hmm. Well, what's our condition? So, what's our hypothesis? Does it say if you have four congruent sides, then you have a square? I don't think it says that. I think it says if you want a square, you need four congruent sides. So we would call having it be called a square that's our hypothesis, and our conclusion is that it's four congruent sides. So, a nice little trick here is if there's no if anywhere in it, the conclusion is going to be after the verb. This is, doesn't, I'm not going to say this 100% any sentence ever works, but mostly with the stuff that we deal with, that's going to be the case. So, if a polygon is a square, then it has four congruent sides. If you don't know what the word polygon means, it means shape. The word polygon literally, literally means many sides. So if a shape is a square, then it has four congruent sides. So um, let's show why it's not the other way around. Like if we've got four congruent sides, then it's a square. Here's two shapes with four congruent sides. Neither of these are squares. That's more like a diamond. This is called a rhombus. Um, since it's not at right angles here. And then this is just not a four-sided figure. So let's see. Write each statement as a conditional. Let's see. A triangle with all angles congruent is equilateral. So it's like, as long as that happens, then we get equilateral. So we could call this our hypothesis. We could call this our conclusion. This is our setup. This is our punchline. So we could say, if a triangle has angles congruent, then the triangle is equilateral. I could definitely use different words to say that. This is just how I am choosing to write it right now. Um, so another version of that, 
uh, could be if a triangle has all congruent angles, then it is equilateral. So um, using words like it are dangerous because sometimes people use the word it without referring to anything to get kind of nitty gritty into the grammar of it. Um, but if you notice, I have the word it here. And recently, we talked about the word triangle here, which is like, the, that's the subject of our sentence. So then when I use the word it, I'm referring back to the subject. Um, sorry for the dense grammar lesson. Alberto can go to the movies if he washes the car. Ooh, I see if, if, if he washes the car. So how could we set this up as that's our actual hypothesis, and then this is our actual conclusion. So we could say, if he washes the car, wait a minute, if who washes the car? So we'd say, if Alberto, then he can go to the movies. So, and just for you, uh, for you grammar stumps out there, it would totally be fine for you to say, if he washes the car, like, why am I running washers? If he wash, washers the car, washes the car, then Alberto can go to the movies. This is a correct sentence, right? Putting Alberto in the end of the sentence, it's just a, maybe an, a, an artful way of writing the same sentence. It's like, as long as he does his homework, Tommy can watch the movie, you know? like using different name, slightly different situation. That's a real sentence, it'd be fine. Um, so let's see. What is the truth value of each conditional? Explain your reasoning. So how true is it? Um, if a quadrilateral has a right angle, then it is a rectangle. So think about this for a minute. Um, I'm just going to give it away in three, two, one. All right, let's see. Let's draw any random quadrilateral we want. I'm drawing this one. Uh, it's got a right angle there. It looks like a rectangle to me. Oh, it has four right angles. What if I drew a quadrilateral with just one right angle? And you may be like, well, how do I do that? Well, maybe you don't know what the word quadrilateral means. Quad means four, lateral. So this is four-sided figure. Here, let me use my line tool to better show what I'm trying to show. Okay, so boom, boom, and then me, and then me, right? There's a four-sided figure, a little boomerang. Um, and hopefully you can see that is definitely a right angle right there. Is that a rectangle? Nope. So we could say this is sometimes true, but in general, this is a f we would say this is a false statement. The only way we're going to call this true is if it is always true. So let's see. If X is a midpoint of line segment AB. All right, well, let's draw a line segment. I can... Bop, bop, like that, and go, wah, here's AB. From A to B. So if X is a midpoint, so let's just pretend, okay, right? So X is a midpoint, then X is actually on the line segment. Is that true? Yes, this is always true. You can't, you can't be a midpoint and not be on the line. Like, well, it's the same distance from both. Yeah, but it's not on the line segment. The definition of a midpoint is that it's actually on the line segment. So because of that, this is true. Oh, and when we're talking about these things, don't be going like fru and tulse. You know, don't give me any of that. We ain't, we ain't got any space for that, okay? Don't do one of these where you draw the T and the F and, like, it's partly together. Oh, no, I just meant to write the F and the T. You know, it's no, 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 no. <laughs> All right, so woof, now we got a whole bunch of junk to read through. So, I'm trying to make this brief 
Uh, feel free to let me know if I didn't explain something well in here. Um, all right. So. So now we're going to look at related conditional statements. So a conditional has a hypothesis and a conclusion. So that's like if P, then Q, right? So that's how we write it, and that's what it means. Then there are some different things here. So if that's our original, then we have something called a converse. And converse is just a shoe brand. I mean, converse is you literally just reverse it. You put the Q first, then the P second. So that's if Q, then P. So the negation of a statement is the exact opposite meaning of the original statement. So it has this little uh, tilde symbol, tilde symbol. I don't know how to pronounce it. Um, do I have an on-screen keyboard? Where is it? Can you tell me where it is? Anyway, it's um, on your keyboard, like if you go to the very top left of your keyboard, uh, it's up there. You can push shift and push it, and it'll make that little guy. That means not. So anytime you see that in math language, it means not. So, so not P. So, so the converse was when we reversed it. The inverse is when we say if not P, then not Q. And the contrapositive is when we say not Q, then not P. So we're going to evaluate a, um, an example with all these things. So example, if it's snowing outside, then it's below 20 degrees Fahrenheit. So P, it is snowing outside. Q, it is below 20 degrees Fahrenheit. That's our setup. That's our punchline. That's our hypothesis and conclusion. So the converse the converse of this, well let's uh, I'm, let me separate this out real quick. Um, so this is our P statement, right? And this is our Q statement. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to set this up so that I can do some dragging and dropping. Um, boom, and then boom. OK. So Q and then P. Oh, wait. Oh, no, no, no. Hold on. And um, I didn't think about that. Let me just uh, shrink these down a little bit. OK. So it says, I'm going to use that for my arrow, OK? So P, it is snowing outside. Q is below 20. So if it is snowing outside, then it is below 20 degrees Fahrenheit. What if we reverse that? If it is below 20 degrees outside, then it is snowing. If it is below 20 degrees outside, then it is snowing. Um, I think you hopefully know from, uh, from years and years and years of having cold days without snow, that's not true. There are times that that is false. So we would call that false. So, so negation. So if we see that P, that just means instead of saying it is snowing outside, we'd say it is not snowing outside. That's all that would mean. Currently, that is true. <laughs> um, 
sometimes that will be true, sometimes that is not true, but in this, we, we just say, hey, it's not snowing outside right now. That's all that means. So, wait, I thought I made you an infinite cloner. Oh, it's because I deleted the, it's because I deleted the thing, right? Okay, turn it back into an infinite cloner. So, so we got our P, we got our Q. This says, if it is not snowing outside, then it is not below 20 degrees Fahrenheit. If it's not snowing, then it's not cold. That's not true. It can be not snowing and really cold outside. <laughs> Um, okay, contrapositive time. So we put Q first, we put P second, and we, we put the if and the not. So if it is not below 20 degrees Fahrenheit, then it is not snowing outside. So if it's, if it's not below 20 degrees, it's not snowing. So this will require some science knowledge. Um, this is not true. This is also false. Um, I think if we had done like 40 degrees or 50 degrees, then, then there might be something to go with there. But uh, 20 degrees, no, you can be over 20 degrees and still snowing. All right. Biconditional. All right, this is... A really really important one for us by we should remember what that means from bisectors it means two two conditions so by conditional is the combination of conditional and its converse so if P then Q and if Q then P so when P and Q have the same truth value the by conditional is true when they have opposite truth values it is false all right so let's check this out Oh, also, uh, so we see P, and instead of doing an arrow like that, if P then Q, you actually just do a, an arrow that goes in both directions like that. Um, there's another way that you can write this. Um, it's, a, it's a shorthand notation. It stands for the phrase if and only if. It's I-F-F, like if with an extra F on it. So piff Q. <laughs> um, that's just a notation that I learned in college that I think I could share with you. Okay. So biconditional for the following conditional. What's its truth value? If two lines intersect at right angles, then they are perpendicular. So the way that we write this as a biconditional is instead of writing if this, then that, we write two, oh, I'm in caps lock mode. Two lines intersect at right angles if and only if they are perpendicular. All right. So the way that this works is you read it one way, then you read it back the other way. And if it's true both ways, then it's true. So two lines intersect at right angles. So boom, boom, right angles. We could say, if two lines intersect at right angles, then they are perpendicular. Well, that, that way is true. Let's start the other way. If two lines are perpendicular, then they intersect at right angles. Well, the definition of perpendicular is that they intersect at right angles. So if I draw two perpendicular lines, they have to intersect at right angles. So this is true in both directions, making this whole thing true. If either one of these is false, what happens to the other one? So if two lines intersect, let's say they don't intersect at a right angle. If two lines don't intersect at a right angle, then they are not perpendicular. Cool, so if one fails, the other one fails too. Let's start, let's say these two lines are not perpendicular. Here, I'm gonna make these two lines are not perpendicular. Then they don't intersect at right angles. 
So you can read it top to bottom and they affect each other. They're inseparably linked. All right, let's see. What are the two conditions? Let's see. The product of two numbers is negative if and only if the numbers have opposite signs. So if and only if that's our special doo -doo 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 double arrow. The product of two numbers is negative if and only if the numbers have opposite signs. Product of two numbers. So let's do a times b, right? How do you get a times b to be a negative number? Well, okay. How do I get a times b to be a negative number? Hmm. So, have you figured out some situations where that is? All right, let's, uh, let's try to write this as a conditional. If the product of two numbers is negative, then the numbers have opposite signs. Let's reverse that. If two numbers have opposite signs, then their product, project, wow, product is negative. So these are the two conditions. Let's see, if the product of two numbers is negative, then, then the numbers have opposite signs. Basically, can you think of a time when this is not true? Um, this is always true. What about the reverse? If two numbers have opposite signs, then their product is negative. This is also always true. So, this biconditional is true. This if and only if is true. And you might be like, wait, aren't these kinds of things always true? Well, let's look at an example where, where we have something that isn't always true. So, here's one. If you play the trumpet, then you play a brass instrument. Um, in case you don't know, trumpets are in a family called the brass instrument. So, so we can say, if you play trumpet, then you play a brass instrument. That is true. What if you reverse that? If you play a brass instrument, then you play the trumpet. Um, something else that's called a brass instrument is the tuba, or the French horn, or the baritone horn, or the euphonium, or the flugelhorn, or the bugle, or the... There's a lot of different options besides the trumpet that fit into the brass family. So since that's not true, you couldn't say this is an if and only if. Um, so I think we got one more here. Write and determine the truth value of the converse of the conditional. If a polygon is a quadrilateral, then it has four sides. So our converse would be, if a polygon has four sides, then it is a quadrilateral. All right, so I think we need to clean up the language just a little bit here. Um, I think we want to say, exactly four sides. So let's just have the word exactly right here. So as long as a polygon, if a polygon has exactly four sides, then it is a quadrilateral. So the original is true. If a polygon is a quad quadrilateral, then it has exactly four sides. Let's reverse that. If a polygon has exactly four sides, then it is a quadrilateral. So this is true. Um, that's just the definition. So we could use an if and only if for this then. We could say, we could say a polygon's a quadrilateral if and only if it has exactly four sides. Let's see. If two angles are complementary, then their angle measures add up to 90. So we could reverse this statement. If two angles add up to 90, then those two angles are called complementary. 
two angels. Nope. Two angles add up to 90. Then they are complementary angles. So this is true as well. This is just the definition of complementary angles. So we could use two angles are comple... Com I always want to write complementary with an I. Complementary. If and only if their angles add... Uh, if and only if they add up to... Um, I am using a little bit less formal language than, than they use here. Like their angle measures, if you said two angles are complementary, if and only if they add up to 90, no one's going to be confused about that. I don't think there's anything wrong with skipping angle measures. I think this is totally fine. Um, at least in this class. Maybe you are going to encounter a teacher at some other point and they're like, no, you must say angle measures. Well, then do that. You want to get credit. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, that's going through the notes on this. There's a lot of stuff here. Let's just do some reviewing. Biconditional, that was the if and only if. That was, it has to be true read both ways. Conclusion, this was our then statement, and that was linked with our hypothesis, which was our if statement. So these two were, were inseparably linked together. Um, then we had conditional. That's just all the things we've done today. Um, contrapositive. Contrapositive is that's when not Q implies not P, right? So that was um, back to our reigning example. Um, contrapositive was if it's not below 20 degrees, then it's not snowing outside. So it's not true, but. Um, Contrapositives sometimes are true. Um, then we had converse. Converse was just instead of P then Q, it was Q then P. I guess conditional was uh, if P then Q. And if the P's and Q's aren't working for you, you don't have to use that language. Um, inverse. All right, actually, my brain is not remembering what inverse is right now. Let's see what inverse says. Oh, not P, then not Q, right, okay. Not P implies not Q. So there are, it's possible to have a situation where the, the original conditional's true, the contrapositive's true, the inverse is true. There's, there's, there's ways to have lots of these things be true, or I think there's a way to have all of them be true. So I'm just gonna write not for, so negation just means not. So yeah, we didn't talk about a truth table today. We may talk about that. It's either true or false. Just a reminder, with true, true must always be true no matter what. False means, means, means it's just not guaranteed to always be true. So true is really, really hard to get. False is very easy to get. True has to be true no matter what, and false is like, eh, sometimes it's not true. So hope this was helpful. Uh, I might do a video going through the homework so you can get some more practice. Um, yeah, bye.